Morning. <laughs> Let's get you active to start. Hands up if you think bravery is a good thing. It's kind of the easiest thing we're going to have to ask ourselves. <laughs> because we all see bravery as a, as, a, as, a, as a good thing. And yet, what I think we'll discover as we go on through is that there's ambiguities around the word bravery that make it harder to understand how do we draw bravery from people, how do we act brave, who is brave, when is bravery used as a way of reinforcing somebody else's story that doesn't necessarily uh, tell us what we, um, what we believe. Um, but bravery does appear to be a good thing and yet there's also a fine line between bravery and stupidity. Yeah? When does somebody behave in a way that's really brave and it goes horribly wrong and you don't notice that it was brave, you just notice it was stupid? At the same time, often when we refer to people behaving in a brave way like that, do you remember the, uh, the, 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 the chap who landed the plane on the Hudson River and, and it was just incredibly dramatic and we all remember it because visually it was very strong. And yet the, the, the pilot himself said that he just sort of behaved normally. Um, he was doing his job. He'd almost been trained to be able to respond to a situation that went horribly wrong in a very normal way. So perhaps as we develop our skills and our personalities and our experiences, things that would have required enormous amount of bravery actually become really quite normal for us. And one of the things I've learned in life is that as we learn, as our, as our characters develop, um, it's very hard to remember how we used to face up to things that now we take as quite normal. Um, so there's a level at which, by behaving brave, we develop our competencies and skills so that we can do a load of things in a really sort of normal way that doesn't require stupidity, that isn't stupid, but to others may look incredibly brave because to them being able to do such a thing is quite remarkable. Um, I think in a way, um, you know, so justice I think is a word that comes very strongly with the word bravery. Um, we think of um, people being brave who, who, who have a sense of, of, of justice. Um, and yet justice is a word that can be thought of from different angles as well. So although we might refer to our soldiers being brave in battle, if you're on the other side of the battle, you may not see them as brave. There was a kind of really curious article in The Guardian yesterday on page three about one young guy who's English, who has been, who's the second guy to have died in Syria fighting against Assad. And the really weird thing was that nobody was able to use the word brave and nobody was quite sure how to describe this. And I'm sure most people just ignored the story altogether. Because at one level we've learned that Assad is a bad guy and therefore we're supposed to oppose him. At another level he's not such a bad guy that we're supposed to go in and destroy all his what have yous. And then you've got this young guy who's grown up within England who's decided that he wants to go to Syria, who's engaging with a sort of jihadi alternative, I'm sorry, I'm probably getting that completely wrong at a level, um, but he's engaging with, with, with things that we find incredibly difficult to understand because if he were behaving in that way and then fighting British troops in Afghanistan, he would inevitably be a terrorist. And here he is fighting in Syria against forces that we've decided are bad, but who we used to support for 30 years, so we're not quite sure and we feel very ambiguous about that. And so what was really quite odd about reading the article was how they didn't really almost know what language to use in order to describe the death of this guy or the rationale for him going there. And it was almost through not being able to use the word brave that the article seemed to both have a certain sterility to it, but also it just seemed incredibly odd to be looking at sort of a slightly changed context and then how we suddenly found that the word bravery was missing. Whereas if we change the other situation and you look at that young girl from, was it Pakistan, Malala, or, um, who got injured by some sort of action that was done by the bad guys and she was standing up for education of young women within an area and what 
have you, and then she got brought to the UK where she went through various medical treatment and now she's there saying, I still believe in women's education and things. And it's kind of like a jackpot for the people talking about somebody brave, isn't it? Because she's young, she's been hurt, she's been in a war zone, she's been attacked by the bad guys, she's been saved by the good guys, she's still talking about the morality that we used to justify our actions for being there in the first place. And it's really, really hard to argue with any of those points. But at a certain level, I think the word bravery in relation to her is, is a really reasonable word. And yet, we shouldn't dismiss the fact that this is also being used to justify something that's far more ambiguous than that. <clears throat> Very often, people don't... It's, it's, there's sort of two sides to acting brave, isn't there? The one that actually I think we're, we're, we're very used to is the fact that we're often called upon to be brave when things go wrong. So we don't actually often set out to be brave, but something bad happens, and that draws from us something, draws from us bravery. Um, we've all heard stories of people who've contracted terrible illnesses and have then... It's not just them who have to act brave, it's the people all around them that have to act brave. Um, and they'll say, well, if it wasn't for the fact that I'd contracted this illness, or if it wasn't for the fact that I'd lost my job, if it wasn't for the fact that something bad happened, I wouldn't have ended up doing the thing that was brave. This is quite interesting because, again, you can't then say, well, if we want more people to be brave, therefore we should wish illness on them, therefore we should sack them all. Um, we've already taken away workers' rights already, so we're not exactly sort of making it any worse. Um, so we can't just turn around and say that. Equally, when you look at bravery, um, sometimes people say, well, they acted bravery because they had nothing, so they had to act brave. But that doesn't mean we wish poverty on everybody in order for them to be able to act brave. And we also know that a big limitation on people even being able to operate within creative industries is, is that they don't have any money, so they can't afford to work in a way that develops the skills and gets them into the sector in order to be able to act brave within the creative sector. It's incredibly hard. But equally, if you do have so much wealth, are you willing to forego some of the security that comes with that sort of space in order to be able to challenge norms and explore things in a new way. Maybe you're already so conditioned towards that, that sort of security blanket that you don't know how to do it. It's, it's, it's really, really odd. Are young people braver than old people? Well, sometimes they're braver because they don't have so much to lose. Sometimes they don't have kids to bring up. They don't have mortgages to pay. They don't have things like that. They talk about the bravery of the youth. Um, but equally, that often can tend towards the stupidity as well. We know that too. Um, but why should we, as we get old, lose that bravery, especially if we understand that what we've developed through time is the skills that make some of the things that would have been incredibly brave normal? So hopefully, as we get older, we develop more skills, we get smarter, and we're actually more confident in our ability to do things, and we take that position on. But that doesn't mean that we don't get scared. Um, I mean, personally, I think sometimes I'm not quite as brave about jumping into some of the things that I might do because I've got burnt in the past by jumping into things too soon and finding that they've all gone horribly wrong and therefore I'm more scared the next time of jumping in before I've resolved everything to get to a point where I then press the button and say, do it. Um, uncertainty is clearly a part of, of bravery. Um, we enter into uncertain space, either because we've been dragged into that space and it's drew, drawn bravery from us, or in acting in a way where we change circumstances and we do something that's original, some, certainly for us, then we are entering into uncertain space. And I think that this is one of the really important things that is part of our lives at the moment. The idea, I mean, to me, I, I always look at the world and I see change. I always see uncertainty. I always see things. I see time as, lin as, as, as um, cyclical rather than linear. I don't see life as just sort of one day after the next, inevitably towards my death, where hopefully at some point I've paid enough into a pension pot so that I can go on holiday and da 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 da. <laughs> but I do see time as cyclical. I mean, part of my work is producing shows, and those shows happen at times of the year, and so year on year you do that show. 
well, if we open at 6 o'clock on September the 18th, then we're open at 6 o'clock at the 18th. You know, you can't carry on wondering about it. The 18th of September comes along, 6 o'clock comes along, and that's when you're open, and that's what it is. Um, and next year, the 18th of September will be the 17th of September, and it will be 6 o'clock, and it will open, and it will happen. So see, time happening is there. Change is happening in that sort of way. But change isn't just towards complete chaos. It, there's, there's cyclical elements to change. I notice change going on all around me, um, uh, looking at the people who are on the, uh, in the seats opposite me on the train coming here, or just um, looking at how one of the spaces is being used in another sort of way. Or I'll, I'll look at a building and I'll notice it's empty, and I'll go, oh, I wonder what you could do with that. Mm. I get really, really excited by the capacity of operating within spaces and saying, what can we do that brings life to that space? And it's not just about the show itself. It's about setting the space up so that others could use it. It's about seeing that if you put energy into a particular area, that provokes change across a wider set of areas. There's all those sorts of changes that are going on. Um, but equally, I think people are very uncomfortable with the idea of uncertainty and change because you don't know what's going to happen. To an extent, experience teaches us that it probably doesn't go so horribly wrong that you can't get up the next morning. I mean, we've all done terrible things. We've all failed in various ways, and yet we've all still made it here today. Encompassing failure is really, really important within this because, and certainly exploring failure, certainly understanding that something won't work helps us to understand maybe what will work. So we have to explore this uncertain space in order to find the things that are worth committing to, worth making that effort, where again we still can't be sure what's going to, to happen next. And that requires bravery. And, and in many ways people don't want us to act brave anymore. They want us to be absolutely in control of everything that we do. It's almost like the response to all the uncertainty that there is in the world is for people to operate more control orders around what's going on. Um, provide people with less freedom, narrow the, narrow the parameters of people's work and their, 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 their scope to do things. And I think this is incredibly sad. Um, one of the joys of operating as a small creative business is that you have the license to be able to go off and do lots of stupid things. Yeah. Whereas when you get into big organisations, then suddenly all the targets, all the metrics have been weighed in so heavily that nobody's allowed to operate in a way that, 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 that changes that. It took me years to understand that the reason why lots of people didn't employ me is because when they came to me and said, I've got a job, can you do this? I used to go, oh, that's interesting. You could think about it like this, or maybe you could think about it like this. And the poor sod was going, no, I just said, can you do this? <laughs> And really what I wanted to, needed to say was, yes, I can do that. <laughs> because I didn't understand that this guy was given a job where he was told by his boss, you have this much money in order to do this. Go and find somebody who will do this. And as soon as I got to here, the guy was going, uh, 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 oh my God, I don't know what's going to go on. And suddenly he was more in danger of being fired. Whereas if I just did this, he wouldn't achieve anything. Nothing would benefit anybody as far as I could see but it would mean that nobody had done anything that buggered with the sort of linearity of somebody being told you have this much money to do this job. So really understand, you will fail consistently if you say anything interesting to anybody that comes to you and says, can you please do something for me? It will screw you up. You have to kind of understand that most people don't like that. It's a curious thing, again, I've often found people have talked about me being a pioneer and they talk about liking pioneers, but actually what I've learned through life is that people by and large hate pioneers. <laughs> you know, it's one of those massive gaps. You know, people say they like brave people, but actually there's so many sort of insistences that we're not brave. You know, don't tell people you're not normal. Don't tell people that you're interested in something other than the sort of standard. And again, with pioneers, you know, because what, what, what are you doing as a pioneer? You're basically saying, how about we do something else? And people go, why can't we carry on doing what I do? Maybe you're going to do things that I don't understand. Maybe I'm going to feel foolish because of that. Maybe I'm going to be excluded because I'm no longer going to be necessary because you're going to show that there's another way of doing things. I don't understand what you're talking about. 
I therefore won't invest in you, I therefore won't support you, and in fact, I'll go around going, you know that guy, <laughs> bloody idiot, isn't he, eh? <laughs> so please be aware that although you know that you love pioneers, you don't. <laughs> or that there's all sorts of things that stop us from really even appreciating what a pioneer is or how they're operating. You know, are they mad? I don't know very often. I, mean, you know, I think we have quite an allowance. What we've done in producing shows is provide the space to allow people to do things that are really smart and really cool and do better things and have a challenge, have a, a delivery point, have all sorts of things that provoke people to do good things. And very often we've had people involved in shows, not because we've seen work from them that looks fantastic, but because we've seen what they seem to be vaguely doing and we like their attitude. An attitude is really, really important that we do support, and it's not an attitude that says, yes, I'll do what I'm told, yes, I'll do what I'm told, yes, I'll... It's somebody that's going, oh, I don't know, or I'm really confused, or I'm really uncertain, or... Uh, but I've got this thing, and it really... I quite like that, and there's this person, and, and that's exciting, and then out of that state of uncertainty or ambiguity comes a sort of desire to do something, and I think there are ways in which we can encourage people to pursue that path. Clearly, I think if we look around East London, it's the peer group learning that has led to the real, real growth of the creative sector here. Because when we came here in early, with the mid-90s, I mean, there was very little of it going on. There's certainly none of it was public. We ended up being the first contemporary retailers in Brick Lane. Well, that looks pioneering. That looks very brave. In some ways, it was very stupid. We were far too early. Nobody had a clue what was going on. We did all the work to get everybody excited about the old Truman Brewery and its retail potential and its showground potential. And the, there was a generation of people emerging in that period, partly driven by things operating on there. I mean, big reason why people did things for themselves and we started seeing creators as drivers of business was because nobody was giving them a job. Manufacturing had left. People didn't know how to invest in it. We were coming out of a recession. People were going, can you do this for me? And people were going, but I want to do this. And the only way to do that was to become the driver of business rather than the servant to business. And this is one of the massive changes that we're seeing. It's that creators are drivers of their own ambitions. They're equity owners in the ideas that they're coming up with. They're not just sitting around waiting for somebody to love them, waiting to give away their ideas to somebody. Even though if you do come up with a really good idea, there'll be all sorts of people that you've never heard of will suddenly think it's theirs, and they'll take it on. And we'll see that happening. Um, if I look at some of the, my own personal drivers, a lot of it is because I didn't know how to behave in the normal ways that you were supposed to. I wasn't very good at doing a job. I wasn't very good at um, you know, sort of doing what I'm told. Um, I'm not very good at swallowing my sense that my boss is an idiot. <laughs> or having a dialogue with them and saying, well, how about we do something else? And it's, you know, because not every, and, and saying the boss is an idiot, it wasn't true, I didn't work. Um, but I couldn't find a job that anybody could give me that would fulfill me. So I had to do something that was my own. Um, that doesn't mean that I think everybody should be doing that because I think there's an enormous number of skills that I missed out on by not going to work for other people, people who have much more linear skills than me, sort of more left brain. We were talking about this a little bit, weren't we? Um, I'm far too right brain to be able to really operate a successful business on my own. Um, but I'm clever enough to be able to just about make that work whilst also exploring ideas. This sort of sense of, um, there was a sort of frustration that came with that. And I've always said frustration is one of the most positive drivers in my life. Um, because if you look at things and things look a bit shit, then you want to do something else and you want to do something about it. But the reason why I came into design and the reason why I'm around the creative sector is that whilst it was perfectly possible for me to be frustrated and angry and go and beat something up, hopefully non-human, it would nevertheless, um, it, was really, it, was really, it was really difficult because you just sort of are surrounded by this sort of complex mix of things apparently going wrong and of opportunities being missed, of, of sort of qualities in people not being encouraged and of people being told conform. 
interesting. One of the phrases that you, when you start looking up bravery and you start, I don't, I tend to try and do most of it and then go back. One of the most common things was people said, the opposite of, the opposite of bravery is not cowardice. The opposite of bravery is conformity. Bravery demands that we explore a space and wonder what else we could do. Um, but design gives us the tools and also the demands to provide something positive in the space that we came across where we think something's missing. Design tells us, deconstruct it. What is it that's really wrong? What else could you put in its place? Do you want to test that? Do you want to provide that? Shall we run that through a process? Shall we see what response we get? Shall we take that on further? Shall we develop a prototype? Shall we try that out? Shall we see where it goes? Because you see, at the moment, bravery, bravery we might think of very often in terms of the individual, but I think that the changes that we're going through in the world at the moment are very much bigger than that. So many of the things that we used to as a society rely on that were solid, that were safe, that were never going to change. Even the words like freedom, democracy, those sorts of things, they've, they've just, they've suddenly become ambiguous, they've suddenly become different. You know, these, these, these things don't translate into those other environments that were all the bad guys, the dictators, the da 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 da, the what have you. So as a group, we are facing up to a time where change is absolutely happening and going to happen. We're not suddenly going to go back to some wonderful equilibrium where everybody knows their place and everybody does as they're told and nothing ever changes. And we don't even know whether that change is going to be financial collapse, whether it's going to be the youth growing up and saying, we're not being given a job, we've got no hope of a home, we're not going to pay for the pension rights that you promised to yourself, we're just not going to do it. We don't know whether it's going to come because other parts of the world are going to be absolutely squashed by climate change or by sort of sectarian fallout or what have you. It just seems as though we're surrounded by massive threats. We don't know whether the microbes that we've been killing with our bacteria, with our penicillins, are finally going to rise up and destroy us in one smart... <laughs> It might be something absolutely ridiculously mundane that totally screws with the entire plot. So there is a threat that's going on. The world is certainly speeded up. It's almost as though we've moved from solid to liquid or from liquid to gaseous. You cannot rely on everything remaining the same. None of us here have really believed that we have jobs for life. None of us really believe that you know, massive change isn't going to happen in some way, or that it might be, as I say, driven by tiniest little things. So we're living in this world, and we're going to have to be brave as a group in order to survive that. And there's a level at which that's incredibly mundane and normal. It's about waking up in the day and taking that creative thought. What do I do given what's available to me today? What do I have to contribute? Can I maintain some sort of sense of decency so that things don't completely screw up just because somebody's taken away my toys? Because I think the toys that we were brought up to believe would be ours have turned out to be false. They're either not very exciting toys or they don't exist as toys and they certainly don't exist as toys for an awful lot of other people if we do happen to have a massive supply of parental gifts given to us to provide for our present then that's certainly not true of everybody else and why should they all be denied it? So we are entering into a time where we are going to have to deal with things that act upon us that we can't readily expect we can only expect the unexpected. So bravery is going to be incredibly important, not just in terms of, um, but in terms of, in terms of character, in terms of you know, what, what, what do you have to give? Um, not just, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? I'm bored stiff of going to people and saying, I've got some great ideas, and people are going, what am I going to get? <laughs> Fuck off. No? Why can't we have an environment where you go to and say, I've got an idea, and people go, great, what can I give? 
You know, why can't we have that? Why is everybody looking for what they get out of something before they've even figured whether they've even got anything bloody useful to contribute? <laughs> so maybe that's where you go when you go and figure out what ideas you're going to explore. You go together and you go, right, look, none of us is going to start by just going, what am I going to get? You go, let's start with some ideas. Let's challenge those ideas. Let's question those ideas. Let's ask ourselves questions about people and wonder how they're going to respond to that. But we will need to collaborate, we will need to gather, we will need to be thinking in terms of how can we together do something that we can't simply do alone. And we will be facing challenges in terms of, you know, even if things largely remain the same, in terms of how do I pay the rent, how do I go and do something that's exciting, how do I, da, 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 da. How do I develop skills so that I'm in a smart position in future, so things that require incredible bravery now become things that are incredibly normal and reasonable the next time we do it. Yeah? Because that's part of the learning. It's not just about waiting until something goes wrong and then suddenly becoming brave. It isn't. It's about step by step by step. It's about every day. It's about da 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 And then probably the thing that triggers the real brave action, the thing that gets you to go, ah, is that that's worth putting the effort into, will emerge through that process more intelligent, more clear, more thoughtful, more deep, more layered, than simply starting by going, let's find the outcome, let's find the solution, then let's put all our energy into doing that. So we need to behave in more emergent ways within life. Yeah? What do we have to contribute? What's the context going on? How do we read that situation? Who can we talk to? Who can we do things with? You are going to need to be brave. <laughs> You have no choice, you know? Nobody's got the freedom to not be brave, I think, anymore. Um, that would be my conclusion. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I produce shows in big old empty buildings and health and safety is a really key element. What I know is that if I can't get people out of a building, then I can't bring them into the building. So if I don't start by knowing how to operate that building in a reasonable way from a health and safety point of view, then I, I can't do it. And, and um, if you are producing shows, the thing that you don't want to have on your conscience for the rest of your life is knowing that you took people into a space and, 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 and people got hurt. Um, now, I know that there is an inevitable risk that we attract in doing the things that we do and um, some people tell me that I'm rather stupid to take on board some of the risks that I do. Um, I think you have to be able to take a, um, an intelligent approach to figuring out how to behave in that sense and if I don't then I'm being stupid. But that doesn't mean that I'm a great lover of all of that. I mean, I know, I mean, I'm thinking of fire officers in particular in relation to that, so maybe I'm talking about the most dramatic. You want to be more or less general. Sometimes being brave as well can be <coughs> challenging those institutions that we have. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those institutions become self-reinforcing, don't they? They kind of... Um, uh, there's also, I mean, in this country, there's less bureaucracy than, say, in Italy, which I know very well in terms of just starting up your own business, for example. So when I talk to Italian bureaucrats and I go, well, look, you know, you're just putting massive obstacles in the way of people being able to get up and have a go. They sort of laugh and they're a little bit embarrassed because they know that it's true. But, um, yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes you do have to, I mean, there's quite a lot of business. If you look at the music sector and music, production um, or, or operating venues for example most of the people that are operating the big venues or doing successfully started out behaving illegally actually I mean it's one of the things that you're quite struggle to persuade a government minister about is that actually it's the only time that you get to the point where people end up running these really successful businesses that you champion and say isn't that great it's a creative industry are people who set out doing things that were a bit illegal um, I think to an extent you do have to take your own view. Um, I think if all you ever do is start with the rules and then say how do we conform to the rules, then you probably won't do anything at all. 
Um, but I think being ignorant of what is reasonable to provide for people who you are providing to is, 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 is equally, it's, it's, it's not on. Um, does that answer, or am I being too specific around the sort of area where I'm working? Should we carry on and see if there's other things that then feed back? Maybe we'll... Well, there's, there's, there, there are really, really intelligent mathematics that go into deciding how many people are allowed into a space. I mean, there really, really are. And if you want to do a sort of numbers calculation on a building with multiple staircases and various distances from exits and things like that, and you, you know, there are all sorts of calculations that you go through. And I mean, the people who do that job professionally are extraordinarily good at it. Um, and I know enough about it to be able to do it. I mean, I have a role where I have to do dozens of different roles, and I'm not necessarily the best at any of those roles, but I'm able to maintain a perspective on most of them and the relationship between all of them. And uh, I don't think you can... I don't think you can... I mean, there are, I mean, I've also found myself in situations where we've been so inundated with people and we simply had no expectation that those people would show up in those numbers and you're suddenly dealing with a situation that's massively different to what you could have expected and, and you, it can be quite overwhelming and, and then you kind of have to be sort of really crazily brave to do it. Um, yeah, we had over 3,000 people show up to a party in an outdoor swimming pool complex in Italy when we were expecting 600 because La Repubblica put something on the front page going, there's going to be a great party at Piscina Ragellati tonight. And not only was it the craziest, craziest night, it was the first time we'd ever heard beatboxing in there, and we had Reeps One, who's just stunning. But I ended up spending two hours at the gate on my own with one guy behind me because we had about eight staff and two guys from the Indonesia who were kind of, it was quite mute because when people started jumping over the wall, they started shooing them out like chickens, like this. And we were kind of like, <laughs> not quite Gary and Alan that we usually work with here, but that's fair enough. And meanwhile, so I was there at the gate on my own, just going, no, 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 no. And everybody's sort of streaming up and everybody on their phones and what have you. You've got two hours of this and you don't know which of them is actually going to turn around and start being an arsey old bugger. And that's the one that you. <laughs> And the rest of them, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. And you hope that it's not the policeman showing up. You know, the police showed up like 20 minutes after we closed and we were clearing the whole space. And we just thought, well, had they arrived half an hour earlier, then the whole thing would have been 30 police cars down the street. Da, 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 da. It's quite a, it can be a little bit crazy. I think collaboration is key to bringing through good ideas anyway. Um, Nobody really has all the skills necessary to be able to convert a nice idea into a great product or service and, and get it all the way out. You, it doesn't really exist. And um, you know, One of the compromises that we do have to have as small creative businesses, as small businesses starting up, is that you, 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 you don't have all the skills. And so you're having to do a lot of things that you're really not very good at. And, and you end up putting more effort into the thing that you're not very good at than the thing that you're good at because you need to cover that. Because if you don't, then the whole thing falls apart. And it's a conundrum facing lots of small businesses. It's incredibly hard to plan the growth of businesses that have no money, that, are, that don't have all the skills, that are sort of terrified of the things that they're having to put all this effort into. And, and it's really hard to sort of create the right sort of investment strategy to be able to make that work without giving away all the rights of the creative to other people or da 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 but, um, and it's true also that as businesses get bigger, they end up struggling to deal with the sort of individuals and the individual strands and the, that there. This is actually to do with a failure to understand complexity. It's not, you know, things become complicated and then they become difficult. Um, Managing change, understanding change, is about understanding things that are complex. So when something happens here, it generates this outcome, and then you do it again, and then it generates another outcome. Or you do this, it generates this outcome, it then suddenly changes this condition. Which we, um, the world is actually complex, and we struggle to understand it as complex. We would like to believe that when we understand things, we understand what will lead to what. Yeah? Same input, same output. That's kind of the basis of classical science. 
when chaos theory came along, it was called chaos theory because we suddenly thought, oh my God, we've no idea what's going to happen, which is true. But chaos theory ultimately got normal with that because it realised that there were things that we could understand in terms of how things behave, how things engage with each other. We can begin to sort of market our way around that. Does that make sense? Um, just because organisations get big doesn't mean that they have to become uncreative, but um, it, is off, it is usually the case, that's true. Usually get to more and more control being sort of imposed within organisations. And it's a massive conundrum that they face, because big organisations know that the most crucial thing for the development of that organisation is great ideas. And they don't know how to find great ideas. So maybe they look outside of themselves to, to, to find it. Or it, it it's, it's a massive conundrum is to understand how we behave within complex space. We firstly have to acknowledge that we are existing in complex space and we have to understand that there's a difference between behaving in complex space where little differences can make massive differences or where not caring about this can da 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 da. And a lot of people have been looking at not paying for design skills in order to bring products through to market because they think it's just a cost. There's a friend of mine who used to run the Danish Design Centre and he said 94% of new products that go to supermarkets are not on the supermarket shelf six months later. If ever there was a need to invest in design, it is that only 6% of products that are introduced to supermarkets make it beyond six months. So if you haven't thought about it, if you haven't cared about it, if you haven't challenged it and questioned it, which is what you're doing as a designer, then it's a, a problem. At the moment, lots of people don't want to pay for that investigation because they just see it as a cost with an uncertain outcome. They would rather push something to market and then spend more and more and more money trying to advertise it to keep it in people's mind rather than have that upfront cost. A lot of people nowadays kind of come to me and they go, we want something really, really new and interesting and exciting. And I'll go, well, that'll take quite a period of time. There'll be various iterations, various discussions, various developments. Oh, we're not going to pay you till we know what the outcome is. I'm going, but that's my job, is to help you figure out what the outcome is. You, know, you can't just wait until I've given you the answer before you go, oh, that's great. So again, those of us who are used to dealing within complex space where we don't know what the result will be of the process, who struggle to be able to inform people what the process is, and who've only really got the opportunity to say, well, look at all these things that I've done that were good. It's still a real, real struggle because a lot of the people who are in charge are people who only know how to say, can we define the outcome, please? Can we put in place all the da-da-da-da-da? I think we need the navigational tools to operate within uncertain space that allow that to be a lot more normal than it is at the moment. I think it's that um, when you ask people to enter into uncertain space, it, it is incredibly disruptive, it's incredibly difficult, it's, in, it's incredibly disempowering at the end of the day because you are just completely like, oh my God, I don't know what's going on. Oh my God, something's happened I didn't expect. Oh my God, how's that change it? Um, I think it's absolutely where we are at the moment. I mean, it's a part of my work that we're not talking through today. It's a project called Risk It, which we'll be launching next year, which is about navigational tools within uncertain space. And I mean, the reason why I'm interested to answer the question is because I utterly believe that's what we need. So again, it's taking something that sort of... We, we do act within uncertain space. We're probably going to be acting in more uncertain space. We maybe want to do it because it's incredibly exciting and it's incredibly fun. And because believing that we can continue to behave within certain spaces is becoming more and more of an absurd thing. You know, I, about 10 years ago, came up with some very simple models for looking in that space. And when I was going to do it, um, the reason why I didn't bring it through at that time was partly because I didn't want it just put, a, put into this pocket called help for creative startup businesses who were obviously displaying lots of uncertainty, lots of complexities, lots of agilities, lots of all those sorts of things. I said, no, this is, relates to everybody. But at the time, nobody was really interested in uncertainty. Now, the contextual shift that we've had is 2008, 2009 and the collapse of the financial economy. Yeah, or the near collapse of it, depending on which way you call it. Sorry, we've just charged everybody for 30 years forward. Didn't we? I can't remember 30 years, that's so okay. It won't. Everybody, if you said, look, you know, I'm really interested in how we navigate uncertainty. I mean, why would we need to navigate uncertainty? We're turning everything that was uncertain into certainty. Economics, boom and bust, disappeared. 
Now, this is kind of like science as well, is, is that people assume that you would... That, that, that what we didn't understand was waiting to be understood as something linear. Yeah? So actions create a reaction. What's that action? What's the reaction? How do we put things together, apply a force, and then something happens? And this will happen consistently. And then when we did that, we went, great, something that was uncertain is now in the pocket mark knowledge and certainty. And why it was called chaos theory was because somebody came along and went, well, look, we started with the same starting point, we put the same effort into it, and we got radically different outcomes. Weather patterns was the... Somebody was building weather models, and they, and they went back and they thought, well, we must have done something wrong. And they went, no, actually, no, let's start with the same inputs again, start the model again. Oh, my God, we're getting a radically different outcome once again. So suddenly it wasn't a case that what we didn't understand was waiting to be understood as something linear. Some things are linear, some things are consistent, some things always behave the same way, and some things don't. Now, I think we have to take that on board within our social environment. Because some things may behave in consistent ways, and they're the things we really value. Control, order, consistency, remain the same. But then that bit that's kind of like the chaos thing, which is little differences make a big difference, exploring uncertain space, where's something radically new? It doesn't exist within the known, let's repeat, incrementally improve space. It exists within the creative, dynamic space. But it's also a space where things are uncertain, where you cannot be sure of what's going to happen. And that's where we need to look. So very much what we're looking at is to try to help people to understand that there is a relationship between those things which may be considered to be consistent and certain and therefore you can define the outcome and work towards it, and other things which are uncertain and fluid and dynamic, and where if you sort of put energy in, you can't tell what the outcome is. So there's no point starting about outcome-driven towards radically new ideas, because you don't know what that radically new idea is. The only way to get to a radically new idea is to be approach-led, smart, behave intelligent, explore things, and then see where you go. So this is a project that we'll be doing and introducing through next year called Risk It. Thank you.